I'd like to start by thanking the organizing committee for inviting me to participate in this exciting, rather unique plenary session uh, on COVID-19 supercomputing and artificial intelligence. When David Keyes invited me to speak at this event, I jumped at the opportunity because I run the center of excellence called computational biomedicine, which is funded by the European Union um, Horizon 2020 program. I'm therefore leading um, a center of excellence that conducts computational biomedical research across a very wide range of areas of biomedicine, uh, which include the molecular level, but also others, and they'll be discussed during my presentation today. Apart from the research we do, we also provide support for access to high performance computing for medical research, where it's still something of a novelty. We invest in education and training for people who want to work in this area and also provide a number of other services. For the purpose of today's presentation, of course, I want to talk to you about um, what the nature of the challenge is from the perspective of supercomputers, uh, AI, and uh, the confrontation with the COVID-19 pandemic. The, the problem should be clear, I think, to everyone in the conventional approach to drug discovery in the pharmaceutical sector. It takes on average 10 years and between two and $3 billion to produce one a uh, single drug, that drug is meant to be a blockbuster, a one-size-fits-all product, um, which in reality seldom works effectively for more than around 50% of the population. You consider that for a moment in the post-genomic era when uh, other people are running around telling us about all the sequences there, uh, performing and measuring and, and reporting and storing for, for humans, whole human sequences now, uh, we understand that uh, we are quite individual and the one-size-fits-all model really isn't applicable in the way that um, a pharma company would like it to be. So we're confronted in general and particularly uh, now with the need to produce many more drugs and to be able to do that much more effectively. So in order to do that, when we're confronted with the statistics as described here for COVID-19, uh, a pandemic that's come, as it were, out of nowhere in a matter of months, um, killed more than 400,000 people, affected us all over the globe, and uh, with 8 million confirmed cases, we have to find new ways of addressing drug discovery, vaccine development, and so on. And the way we uh, really go about doing that is based on um, advanced IT methods. We want to be able to use high performance computing, modeling and simulation, big data, machine learning and artificial intelligence to invert the model as it currently exists. And that's the challenge and in a sense the excitement of uh, what we're trying to do. And the, the opportunities there are enormous. I would say uh, what we're really trying to do is uh, transform the approach to biomedicine to be able to move it from a highly empirical approach in which uh, sort of theoretical and modeling methods are used uh, to rationalize after the event observations to putting uh, a priority on the predictions that come out of computers that those predictions would need to be actionable, meaning they are done rapidly, accurately, precisely, and uh, reliably in such a way that uh, a clinician, doctors, and others can take actions, decisions, uh, as the results come off the computer. So that's underpinning the potential for a paradigm shift in medicine take uh, not only drug discovery and development but also other areas of medicine into new ways of um, understanding 
the way life works and the origin of pathologies. In the area of drug discovery, this slide is a caricature that indicates what the current predicament is. One is looking for a needle, that's the small molecule in, in a haystack of a huge number of candidate molecules. The one that you're after is the key that will, so to speak, unlock um, the ability to close down the action of a given protein target, often an enzyme, by fitting in to um, an active site. And the question then is, how can we do that and how can we do that as effectively as possible? Uh, in practical terms, at the moment, in, at this moment in time, there's a lot of random searching. It's heavily experimental, labour-intensive, and time-consuming. Question is then, how can we make IT-based searches more efficient and turn the problem on its head, and thereby reduce times to solution? Of course, the way we're going to do that is by exploiting it as heavily as possible all the information technology-based approaches that we can use and get our hands on. This slide shows the scope of uh, the projects that we're involved in now, the collaboration and its extent. And um, the origin of this very large collaboration goes back to the early days of March of this year, when the pandemic hit Europe and in fact very quickly afterwards into the USA, both sides of the Atlantic people started to begin to plan for initiatives to support research into COVID-19 and hopefully to help with the discovery of new drugs. In our case, uh, with regard to the center of excellence itself, uh, computational biomedicine, we have uh, some 15 core partners, over 40 associate partners, and among them, uh, many who were keen to push and support us, none more so, in fact, than the Leibniz Rechenzentrum, whose logo you can see there, LRZ. Um, and uh, they have made uh, it a special point to go out of the way to support our work by provisioning of very large quantities of supercomputing time on their large machine um, called Superbook NG. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. Uh, the Comp Comp Biomed Center of Excellence has two international partners. One is Argonne National Laboratory and the other is Rutgers and you can see their logos on this slide. And um, Rick Stevens is the, the principal partner from Argonne National Lab working with us in the Comp Biomed Initiative. Indeed, we were already working with both Argonne and Rutgers, Rutgers led by Shantanu Jha, um, and we've been working with them on ways of accelerating drug discovery um, in the area particularly of cancer and other diseases. These uh, applications suddenly were turned on their head when the COVID pandemic arrived and the, the DOE labs in the US and ourselves began to pivot very rapidly at, uh, into the COVID-19 domain. And we were able to do that in sync so that we could draw up plans closely to work on common objectives. In my experience, this is a pretty unique and very large scale initiative aimed at using high performance computing to turn existing uh, models for understanding uh, drugs and their basis of action on, on their heads. The next two slides just take you through examples of the supercomputers that we have at our fingertips for all this work. There's Superbook NG in the center. It's the most powerful supercomputer currently in Europe, in the European Union, I should say, Piz Daint is a bit ahead of it in terms of Europe. Uh, both of them are, are very large machines. Piz Daint is uh, a, a GPU accelerated Cray and Superbooks is an Intel Lenovo machine. 
in uh, the USA, we've got access to a range of very powerful machines as well, Summit uh, and Frontera at uh, Oak Ridge and um, Texas uh, Advanced Computing Center, and also a machine that's undergoing a bit of a change now at Argonne called Theta. At the bottom of this slide, I mentioned the radical cyber tools that Shantanu Jha's team has been developing at Rutgers and Brookhaven as a kind of middleware that enables us to effectively take control of large numbers of nodes on these machines and run workflows in an orchestrated way across them to maximize the productivity and efficiency of the calculations. So all of this has become available to us as part of the uh, research we're doing now in the US-EU collaboration. The consortium is most certainly not just one that deals with supercomputing, theory, data analysis, and artificial intelligence. Although that's mentioned at the top of the slide here, you'll see that the experimental teams are at least in three categories. One of them is doing uh, wet lab assays to try and uh, assess the effect of the proposed drugs on the target compound. Some of this is uh, trying to make measurements of binding free energies, which we can calculate by computational means. Other things are functional and whole cell assays. Then we have structural work, which is developing protein structures that uh, look at how the drugs are bound into the uh, complex with the protein. These, these rely heavily on synchrotron sources, and we have five or six of those available to the collaboration. And last, uh, we have medic, uh, medicinal chemists who are concerned with doing chemical syntheses where necessary to develop new products uh, for evaluation in the context of this collaboration. So we have many of the key uh, aspects that are required to take predictions uh, into a scenario where, from where they could be developed in conjunction with pharma and, and other biotech companies. This is an important concept uh, that I want to get across here. If we're dealing with um, computer simulations, we want to be sure that these calculations are actionable in the sense I described earlier. This is an extension of the idea of weather forecasting where we say um, it might rain tomorrow and the action is you take out an umbrella in, and get ready to use it. Here we can imagine many, in a way, more interesting scenarios where we can make predictions about drugs that can lead to decisions to develop drugs or indeed in a clinical context, what kind of interventions or treatments are going to be necessary. These things then have to be done rapidly, accurately, precisely, uh, and, and indeed reliably. So we have a kind of set of uh, concepts that we uh, designate as VVUQ, validation, verification, and uncertainty quantification. And they are, uh, as it were, protocols we want to subject our codes to, to certify them as being indeed validated, verified, and equipped with particular UQ characteristics. This is designed in general to raise confidence in high performance computer simulations. Uh, in particular, also, we look at this from the point of view of multi physics applications. And we've developed it in another um, EU funded project that I'm leading called VECMA, an open source to toolkit for multi scale um, VVUQ, which is based on generic patterns that are used in this project to uh, endow our predictions with um, reliability and credibility. So the core of our approach in scientific terms is summarized on this slide. We bring together two seemingly divergent approaches, machine learning, gathering lots of data and inferring but properties based on those data. This is the strand which is based around big data and artificial intelligence on the one hand, and the physics-based methods 
that are more compute intensive, but likely to give more accurate results in detail for particular cases. So why use machine learning? I think it's obvious from uh, the necessity of the case we're involved in. We have to do searches in a hurry. We want to use computationally very fast methods that are also cheap in the same terms to search huge libraries of, of molecules, to explore chemical space, to predict new molecules and so on. They depend heavily on access to training data and I'll mention what some of that is in due course. The other side of the description is the physics-based methods, and here pride of place is given to uh, classical molecular dynamics simulations. These are very much old favorites of uh, the high forms computing community and account for pretty large percentages of most supercomputers around the world. And uh, the purpose of using these methods is to generate accurate binding affinity calculations. There are different levels of accuracy with these methods. Some of them can be used in the early stages of drug discovery, um, where we talk about looking for hits um, out of a, a large number of molecules that might have been proposed from a machine learning algorithm. Uh, and then from the HICS, the evolution into lead compounds, which are looked at more closely, and then the lead compounds can be further optimized into what one hopes will be a final product or many such products. It's much more computationally expensive than machine learning and is therefore restricted in terms of the amount of chemical space that it can follow, but the combination of the two is what makes this type of activity particularly interesting. From the perspective of the Center for uh, of Excellence in Computational Biomedicine, we have uh, two, two kinds of applications. They go under the names of ESMAX and TIES. This slide describes for you what the uh, hit to lead aspects of this uh, application are. You run one molecular dynamics simulation and then you will have a large number of errors. But if you run many of them concurrently, as it indicated on the right-hand side with the ensembles, uh, we can run those on very large supercomputers all at the same time. We may be running 20 to 30 of these to get the uncertainty quantification as low as possible. Then we can make reliable predictions that get fed back to another stage of the machine learning. And then that's the hit to lead component and the lead optimization aspect of this is where we take a molecule such as the one down on the right hand side we've got various substituents at positions r1 r2 r3 on a common scaffold or framework and we can ring changes among those um, substituent positions which are relatively small in the order of things that can lead uh, in turn to increased binding affinity of the candidate molecule to the active site. And it's the binding affinity and its size uh, that, and strength that it, it determines how interested we may be in the compound as a potential drug. So the picture overall is this one of combining machine learning with these uh, molecular dynamics techniques. The machine learning can be used to screen very large data sets. They're listed there in some cases, they're larger ones. Virtual libraries might be of billions uh, in size. And uh, we can do the first pass with the machine learning and we can identify the promising lead compounds and then the further optimized compounds by the ESMAX and, and TIES methods. So in this collaboration, we're already discovering many uh, tens to hundreds of potential compounds that can be investigated by our experimental colleagues. And indeed, that's happening already. This is just a passing nod at the fact that there's tremendous media interest in what's going on in fighting COVID. And we've had a lot of uh, attraction uh, of interest from the media, all kinds of things from TV and radio to some of the top weekly and, and daily publications on both sides of the Atlantic. 
let me just move now to uh, another level here, which is the, uh, one of the, the levels beyond the molecular at which comp biomed operates. Um, we have people interested in, in organ systems and codes that model the, the heart in great detail. And this is an application where such codes are being shown to be useful. After you've made a discovery of a drug, usually you might be concerned about its toxicity. In the case of COVID-19, I'm sure you'll be aware uh, because many famous people have suggested they could take some existing compounds that are named here as potential treatments for COVID-19. Um, the only problem here is that COVID-19 itself is linked to fatalities with underlying heart conditions. And one knows very little about the combined risk if you take these particular drugs and have COVID-19. So in, in the light of these important questions, uh, my colleagues on this slide, Mariano Vasquez and Hathmin Haguado Serra, have been uh, using and applying their ALIA code to the in silico assessment of cardiotoxicity in a population of male and female uh, human hearts. And those very same drugs I listed earlier, including hydroxychloroquine and others have been looked at at various dosages. And the story that emerges from this is rather interesting. It shows that uh, male hearts under stress with large treatments, for instance, of fluoroquine, produce left bundle branch blocks at particular plasma concentrations and heart rates. And similarly for female hearts with azithromycin reported in the literature, uh, there are uh, chronic uh, heart uh, failures that can arise, again, with plasma concentrations of around 1.1 molar and particular heart rates in terms of beats per minute. So these show that upper level modeling and simulation can give you a direct handle on uh, the level of toxicity of some of these touted alternative drugs. So coming towards the end of my presentation here, I just would like to step back with you for a moment and try to emphasize what we're doing. We're trying to change the way medicine is actually um, understood and um, applied, that we want to make the subject more amenable to scientific investigation, that it should revolve around theory, modeling, and simulation in addition to experimental research, and that theoretical methods and the simulations related to them can be used for taking actionable decisions. To pursue this further, it's important that we do continue to develop basic research in a more detailed way, not only emphasize translational projects which try to take immediate action with an idea that goes into a clinic, advanced information technology, uh, supercomputers and AI are absolutely essential to accelerate these discoveries. And the international collaborations will provide um, critical mass at a scale that enables developments to occur very rapidly indeed. I want to end with uh, a final slide which acknowledges all the funding agencies that have supported this work and the people who have collaborated most directly with me in taking us to where we are now. With that, I'd like to stop and thank you for your attention. <laughs>